So um, what I'm going to do together uh, today is pull together one of my research areas over the last 10 years or so that um, explore, uses mathematical models to explore the mechanisms of evolution of male mate choice. So male mate choice is not what you usually hear about when you hear about sexual selection. We usually think about female choice for male traits. And male mate choice usually crops up only when we're thinking about unusual mating systems like sex role reversal, um, like these jacanas have, or monogamy, which is common in some groups, but unusual in animals in general, um, such as these crested auklets or barn owls. But um, most systems, mating systems, are actually polygynous. And uh, polygyny, females are the limiting resource. Um, there's fewer females available to mate at any one time than males. And so you expect to have males competing over this limiting resource. So there, ma there should be male-male competition, and there should be female choice, and male-mate choice should be rare. But when you think about it, if males don't have an infinite amount of energy that they can put into courtship, which presumably they don't, um, why should males not also choose? So do we see male-mate choice under polygyny? Well, we do, but we don't see it for every character, and we don't see it in every situation. So there's something special about all the examples I've put up here. So these zebra finches, this orb-weaving spider, this group over here, males are mating based on a trait that's correlated with high fecundity. Um, these species over here, this is an armored ground cricket and a mealworm beetle. Um, males choose based on um, females' reproductive status. So is she a virgin or is she not? In sticklebacks, males choose based on characters that indicate readiness to mate. And in house mice, actually, some evidence they choose based on infectivity status. So they're not just sort of choosing on random traits, what we think of as random traits, or not on the wide variety of traits that we, we think of when we think of female choice for male traits. Right? There's not a whole bunch of sexually selected traits in females. So what I'm going to be doing today is addressing the question of when do we expect the evolution of male mate choice under polygyny. And so to look at this, first I'm going to present a null model that shows why we should expect male mate choice not to evolve under strict polygyny. And then what I'm going to do is talk about behavioral and selective phenomena that can allow the evolution of male mate choice. So altering this null model and how can we actually reverse what we expect from the null model. So first, uh, again, talking about the null model. Um, when I use null model for, um, for mate choice in general, um, what I'm thinking about is its use in the sense that um, Prum used it in a, what I think should be a very influential evolution perspective in 2010, because I think he really hit the mark. You can think of a null model for sexual selection in general being um, what you have when you simply have a preference and have a trait, and you see if the you get evolu subsequent evolution of the preference and the trait, so subsequent elaboration of the two with nothing else going on, no other selective forces other than the existence of a preference and the existence of a trait. So you can think of this as um, evolution of preferences for arbitrary traits under strict polygyny, just some random red patch or something like that. So um, what I'm going to do is first review uh, what we see for this null model of sexual selection for female preferences for male traits. And this is old work by Mark Kirkpatrick and Russ Landy. And then I'm going to look at what happens if we reverse the sex roles and we look at male preferences for female traits. OK, so um, I'm going to use this model of Kirkpatrick in 1982, a very influential early sexual selection model, to describe this arbitrary trait null model for female preferences for male traits. So Kirkpatrick supposed a two locus model with haploids, where we have one locus for a trait where T1 are unornamented uh, males, T2 are ornamented males, so this is expressed in males only. And this ornament comes at some physiological cost, or some predation cost, just some cost in general. And preferences are expressed only in females, so P1 is an allele for random mating, and P2 is a preference for ornamented traits, or ornamented males, you know, ornament in general. And the only other real um, biologically significant assumption here is that females have equal mating success, provided that they survive. So there's um, strict polygyny. So we have, again, females are limited. Every female has equal mating success. They all obtain one mate or an equal number of mates. And you can summarize the results of that model with this graph here. So here we have female preference on the x-axis. And this could be the frequency of that P2 allele, male trait on the y-axis. Um, Russ Landy actually showed you can get something very analogous if you have a, a preference value or a, a mean preference here and a trait value or trait mean 
um, on the y-axis. I'm going to mangle the languages when talking about this. But basically, this population over here um, has a preference for male traits that are greater than the actual trait that's present in the population. Okay? So what you would expect is for um, this population to move upward on this graph as the trait increases. Now, when females have a preference for males with a trait, their offspring are going to inherit both their preference and their trait. They're likely to inherit, sorry, both their preference and the male's trait. So you get this statistical correlation or linkage disequilibrium between the trait and the preference. So as we move upward in this space to increase the trait, we also move over um, because this, this linkage disequilibrium or statistical correlation drags the preference up also. So as the trait goes up, the preference goes up because of the statistical correlation. So you call that indirect selection on the preference. So in one generation, we haven't just moved up, we've moved up and over. And this happens over and over until we hit some sort of line of equilibrium. And this, the position of this line is determined by viability selection on the trait pushing it downwards and sexual selection pushing it upwards. Now the key things here are if we didn't have indirect selection, we would have evolved straight up and hit the line somewhere around here. But because we have indirect selection that's allowed exaggeration of the trait, we have both preference elaboration, so the preference has moved um, significantly from where it started, and we have trait elaboration, so the traits reached a point a lot higher than it would have reached if we didn't have this indirect selection. Okay, so the female preference is evolving, though, solely because of the indirect selection. If we didn't have linkage disequilibrium or the statistical association, the preference wouldn't have gone anywhere. So this is basically the result of the null model for sexual selection when it's female choice, is that female preferences evolve due to indirect selection, and this occurs because of the genetic association or linkage disequilibrium between the female preference locus and the male trait locus. It doesn't require any direct benefit to females with preference, right? It's just a statistical association. And the trait or ornament evolves this balance between sexual selection and viability selection. So Russ Landy and I set out to explore what would happen if we reversed the sexes here, but kept the assumption of polygyny, because we were specifically interested in this situation where males have a limited amount of energy to put into courtship. And what happens if there's a female trait and a male preference? Would we expect to get the same thing? We thought we would. Um, but that was actually wrong. So uh, in the flipped sex role model, here we have traits or ornaments expressed in females. Again, T1 is for unornamented females. T2 has an ornament, which again is a viability cost. So this is very parallel to the arbitrary trait one in males. Preferences are now expressed in males. P1 is random mating. P2 is a preference for ornamented females. Now how are males expressing this preference? Because it's polygyny. Well, they're expressing it um, by courting females differentially. So the male preference affects the distribution of courtship that the males will give to the females. So the additional assumptions we have to make here is, again, we're interested in polygyny, so we're making the same assumption that the female choice model made. Females have equal mating success provided that they survive. And we're assuming that males further have equal courtship effort. So if you have a preference or if you don't, you still have the same amount of total energy that you can put into courtship versus feeding versus anything else you're doing. Um, and then the final assumption we made is that females choose males in proportion to how much they're courted by that male type. So if a female is courted twice as much by a certain type of male, she's twice as likely to mate with him. So kind of the simplest assumption we could think of to make about how females are choosing based among males. And when we um, analyze this model, what we found is that male preferences are actually always lost, which was a surprise to us and took us a while to figure out why it was happening. It's one of those models where post hoc, it seems totally obvious why it's happening, why it's happening. So hopefully I can get that across to you guys. So to figure out why it was happening, um, one thing we did was trace through what's happening to the allele for male preferences as we go through the life cycle. So life cycle is zygotes. We have natural selection, sexual selection, recombination. And the frequency of the male um, preference in zygotes is PM2. And what we did is we looked at the frequency of this male preference among successfully mated males, so right after sexual selection occurs. And if you take the difference between these two, you see we have a positive expression with a negative out front. So basically, our male preference is dropping between these two stages. And this shows. Um, just kind of with the equations, that there is direct selection against a male preference. Because this is happening as you go through the life cycle, 
we know that it's not an indirect selection effect. It's not occurring because of a genetic correlation. There actually is direct selection against the preference that's emerging from these assumptions. So this explains why the male preference is lost, but intuitively, why do we have this direct selection? So here's why, and this is the height of my um, artistry, these birds. So here we have an ornamented female and an unornamented female. And these black peas are the courtship that they're getting from males that have no preference. So males that have no preference, we're assuming all males have six units of courtship that they can give. The males that have no preference will distribute those equally among the two females. Now males with a preference are going to give more of these units to the females with the ornament because they prefer them. So the key thing here, though, is that each of these females is having equal mating success. So they're each going to choose, say, one male from among the males that are courting them. So if that's happening with this unornamented female, you can see she's three times as likely to choose a male without a preference than a male with a preference. Now, the ornamented females are more likely to choose a male with a preference than without a preference, but she's not three times as likely more, so three times more likely. Um, because there's not three times as many peas here, um, red peas than black peas. So the fact that the males with a preference are putting themselves in a high competition situation disproportionately is what causes this direct selection against the preference allele. Okay, so that um, gives you this emerging direct selection against male preferences. So let's look at what that does in this same um, preference and trait space. So the preference is actually going to drop because of this direct selection that occurs throughout the life cycle, right? Um, it's a much uh, more potent force than the indirect selection that was driving the preference in the other model because it's, it's not dependent on the strength of this linkage disequilibrium. Now what's happening to the um, male trait or female trait? Well, the female trait is dropping because of viability selection. But the key thing is it's not actually increasing because of sexual selection, because with, if you have strict polygyny, there is actually no sexual selection on females if they're courted more. They have an equal mating success regardless of their trait. So there's no sexual selection on them. So viability selection is actually pushing this population down in this trait direction, and that's actually causing indirect selection against the preference also. So this preference is getting a double whammy. It's getting this direct selection cost against it because of competition, and it's getting indirect selection against it because we have no sexual selection favoring the female trait. Okay, so what this null model shows is that the, um, when you look at the evolution of preferences for arbitrary traits under strict poly polygyny, male preferences should not evolve. Um, but we do, again, sometimes see male preferences in nature. So what I'm going to do for the rest of the talk is go through a list of behavioral and selective phenomena that on the face of it seem to me and my collaborators to potentially allow you to reverse this direct selection you had in the null model, reverse, reverse or remove it. And um, we've created a model for all of these. I'm going to kind of group these in these three um, categories. So first, characteristics of the female trait, second, characteristics of the male behavior, and third, characteristics of the mating system. So I'm going to spend three to four minutes each on a list of things that I'm going to fit into this framework. And these are all different models from different studies to test whether these ideas that intuitively seem like they could maybe reverse it are actually effective ways to get male preferences evolving. In all these cases, a female trait. Well, no, not quite. Not quite in all these cases. Yeah, actually, in the first two, they're not. But in, in many of them, they are. Female trait would be arbitrary. Yeah. So in the first two, um, are actually ones where the female trait is not arbitrary, and so this is why it seems like maybe this would be some way to reverse this. So the first thing I'm going to look at is what if the female trait is an on honest indicator of high fecundity or an honest indicator of high viability. And um, to look at high fecundity, I simply assumed that T2 females have high fecundity. And again, this matches with what you see in empirical observations that males do seem to have um, preferences for female traits that indicate high fecundity. So one obvious trait that indicates high fecundity in amphibians, reptiles, and fish, and some other animals is large body size. So what if males tend to prefer, like what if large body size is the ornament? So if you analyze a model where you, in addition to all the other assumptions we had before, also allow T2 to indicate high fecundity, what you find is that there's actually a threshold fecundity advantage 
Um, and if males, or sorry, if the fecundity advantage is above this threshold, male preferences can evolve. So here we have a preference strength, and this is how much more males are likely to court females that they prefer than females that they don't if they encounter one of each. This is natural selection cost of the trait, so cost of building a large body. Um, and this is a fecundity threshold. And again, if you're above this fecundity threshold, male preferences can evolve. But you can see if you have um, strong preferences, you actually have to have a pretty high fecundity advantage. So this is parameterized like a selection coefficient. So you'd have to have a, a fairly large fecundity advantage to actually get above this threshold if preferences are reasonably strong. So um, you can actually get male preferences evolving if female traits indicate high fecundity, but it has to be high enough fecundity. You're not necessarily going to be over this threshold just if you have higher fecundity. Um, what about if female traits are in honest indicators of high viability instead of high fecundity? So here I assume that T2 females have high viability, and this might be likely if the preference is directly for high condition or for performance-related traits such as maybe speed or agility of females. Um, so what would we expect in this case? Well, as I said before, um, in the male mate choice for female traits model, we have viability selection against the traits in the, in the example I gave before, and that causes indirect selection against the male preference. So if we actually had the trait indicating high viability instead, that should flip. The trait should move upwards because of viability selection, and we should expect indirect selection to actually increase the male preference. So in order to analyze whether or not this really occurs and whether it's an effective way of getting um, male preference evolution, I used a technique that allows me to partition apart selection on the preferences. And this is um, using a notation developed by Barton and Torelli in 1991. So, um, what it does is it uh, breaks the amount of evolution of at a locus J into terms that represent the amount of evolution, sorry, the, the strength of selection on a locus I, and this is any locus or set of loci that's in the system and could be associated with J, and the strength, sorry, I should label that, there we go, selection on I, and the strength of the association between I and J. So as you could kind of gather from this, what this does is it takes selection on any locus or set of loci i, and it um, kind of maps it onto movement in, at locus j. So you can sum together terms across all sets of loci i that are influencing the, the preference. So if we think about that for just this two locus model with preferences and traits, the change in the preference locus here consists of two terms. The first is just the direct selection on the preference itself times the genetic variation in the preference. So that'll be the amount of evolution of the preference caused by direct selection on the preference. And the second term is direct selection on the trait times the association between the preference and trait. So this is a measure of the amount of evolution of the preference due to indirect selection. And you can pull these out mathematically, which is really powerful, actually. So when I apply this technique to this model where we have honest indicators of high viability, um, you can pull out this direct selection term, and you can see this AP, again, is a big positive thing with a negative out front, so this very clearly shows that we have direct selection acting against the preference locus, or uh, the preference P2 allele. And we can again see the indirect selection term as a positive term, so we have positive selection um, on the trait, and again, you can see here that there's no preference coefficient, which is alpha here, there's only ST, which is a viability selection on the trait, which again kind of reconfirms that there's no sexual selection on the female trait in this model. But the really powerful thing is because we have these expressions, we can actually plug a bunch of numbers into these and quantitatively compare the strength of direct and indirect selection in this model. So um, I did that, and I'm just going to show you a few examples on a sort of sample graph. So what we have here are the partitions of um, direct selection on the preference in red, and indirect selection in green, this dashed line here is at zero, so that would be no change in the preference. Um, there's some values here where ST is negative, so those, these ones are actually for selection against the traits. So you want to probably focus on these ones over here. And you can see just by the positions of the red and green lines compared to zero, and also by this, these um, black squares, which are the sum of the red and green, that indirect selection is not capable of actually dragging the change in P to be positive. So indirect selection is not capable of actually overpowering the direct selection 
against the preference allele that's caused by competition. So we still get a drop in preferences. Um, so this is not an effective method. So to summarize what we found for these two, indicator, um, these two mechanisms, and what I'm going to do in general on this slide is I have this little key. So green check means that the mechanism has realistic potential of actually leading to the evolution of male preferences. Um, a blue check means it can lead to a kind of a weakish and not very impressive maybe polymorphism in the male preference. And X means that this is not a likely mechanism to lead to the evolution of male preferences. So with this key, honest indicators of high fecundity gets a green check because provided the fecundity advantage is big enough, not always, but provided we have a big enough fecundity advantage, this is certainly a way you can get male preferences evolving. Um, but honest indicators of high viability kind of sounds good, but it doesn't, doesn't really work. It's not an effective way of getting preferences to evolve. And that's not that surprising because um, indirect selection in many contexts has been found to not be very effective at countering direct selection because it's usually weak because statistical associations are very often weak, not universally, but very often. Okay, so um, moving on. What if we have um, the female trait actually being pleiotropic with a male trait? And this is something that we actually see quite a lot in nature. So female traits may resemble full or weak expression of male traits in many taxa. And uh, I'm showing these pictures up here. I'm not saying that the reason that um, these traits are evolving in females um, is because of male preferences in these taxa. I'm, I'm simply asking the question of if we have pleiotropy of the um, female trait along with the male trait, is that sufficient to actually get male preferences evolving? So in order to, to really talk about this situation of pleiotropy of female traits and male traits, I'm first going to have to backtrack just for a second and talk about what happens if you have female traits and male traits and female preferences and male preferences all together in a model. So Russ Landy and I actually looked at this mutual mate choice model where we combined the um, male and female choice models that I described before. So we have male traits and female traits where females prefer the male trait. Males prefer the female trait. We have all of those viability costs of the traits in there that we had before. We have males expressing their preference through courtship, and we have females expressing their preference by choosing from among courting males. So everything that was in there before all together. And if you analyze this model, what you find is that you get identical behavior for male choice as we had from the male choice alone model. And you get identical behavior for female choice as you had from the female choice alone model. So even though, again, we for some reason weren't expecting this, the male choice and female choice systems are actually completely decoupled if you put them all together, which makes sense because we didn't actually couple them in any way. We just threw everything in there together, and lo and behold, they're independent of one another. And this is true, um, again, one of those, like, why didn't we realize that before we did this? Um, but models, you know, that happens a lot, right? That's good. So um, this is true unless you actually have pleiotropy. If you have pleiotropy, then you get coupling and more interesting things start to happen. So I'm going to look at two cases of pleiotropy. In the first one, we're going to assume that the preferences and the trait are both pleiotropic. So we have male traits um, weakly expressed in females, and we have female preferences weakly expressed in males. So this is mainly like the Kirkpatrick model. We just have weak expression of the preference and trait in the opposite sex. And it turns out that the results you get look a lot like the Kirkpatrick model, too, with one interesting difference. So um, in the Kirkpatrick model, oh, here again, sorry, we have preference on the x-axis and trait on the y-axis. And in the Kirkpatrick model, we essentially had the same uh, equilibria. This is a stable equilibrium here, unstable, stable, unstable. In the Kirkpatrick model, you had a stable line of equilibrium down here. And if you have um, the male traits weakly expressed in females and the female preference weakly expressed in males, you lose this line of equilibrium in the middle. It turns into a quasi-linkage equilibrium line, so it's a trajectory that you evolve rapidly to, and then very slowly down along until you actually hit trait loss, and your preference has been reduced a little bit in frequency. So um, do we get male preferences evolving in this model? Well, yeah, they can evolve where female preferences could before, because you also have female preferences, pleiotropic expression along with female preferences. But they actually restrict the space in which you had preferences evolving in general before. Because before we had this polymorphic line of equilibrium that now we don't have anymore. We always get a little bit of loss of preference and loss of the trait along that line. So male preferences, introducing them is hurting, but you can actually get them evolving in some of this space just as a byproduct of having female preferences evolve. 
Um, and then I looked at a second locus of pleiotropy where really only the trait is pleiotropic. So here we have a preference expressed in females and at a separate locus a preference expressed in males. The trait is actually just plain old pleiotropic though. So in this case, um, male preferences actually have a much harder time evolving. Uh, here we have preference strength on the x-axis and this is um, equilibrium value of the preference P2 in males on the y-axis. If you look at this axis, we were starting, I actually tried to maximize male preference evolution here. So I started it at a very a frequency with a lot of variation at 0.5. Um, and even with that little boost, these are different preferen female preference strengths. So with the highest female preference strength, you get the most increase of the male trait, which is pleiotropic with the female trait due to sexual selection. So that should actually help everything evolve the fastest. Even in that kind of best case scenario, this is a blow up. You can see we get very, very little male preference evolution. So this is not impressive. It's moved from 0.5 to 0.506 or something. So it's not an effective way to get male preferences evolving with really stretching here to get it to do anything at all. So um, pleiotropy, even though that's often touted as a way that we might get the expression of traits in females, it's really not helping us in any sense get it to get preferences in males. It's kind of, you know, they're allowed to evolve if they're a pleiotropic expression of female preferences, but they're kind of hurting in that situation. And in the case where they're not, the preference isn't pleiotropic, they're really not doing anything impressive at all. Tiny, tiny little bit of evolution. So this is not an effective way. I gave it a green check just because it can drag along with female preferences, but this is not impressive. All right, um, what if the female trait indicates what species this female is? Surely that should be a way that we can get male preferences evolving. So to look at this, um, I consider the situation where we have traits evolving in allopatry and hybrids are doing poorly. Okay, so we're again trying to maximize the chance that we should really get preferences evolving um, to court your own type of female. So this is really with a reinforcement model, so the process of reinforcement of um, species boundaries. So here we have a male trait that's um, diverged, sorry, female trait that's diverged, right? Well, well I'm going to be looking at this in both sexes. I'm going to compare the two. So we have a trait that's diverged, and the choosing sex initially doesn't have a preference. So if these guys mate and produce poor fitness hybrids with a little X because it's a poor, sad, dead fish, um, we really expect that any population-specific preferences should have a benefit, right? So you, you might get preferences for blue evolving in this first population and preferences for red evolving in the second. And so um, I initially looked at this with a preference locus that I allowed um, two preference alleles to evolve in either population. And what I'm going to do is compare the results you would get from a model like this if you have female preferences evolving for male traits versus male preferences for female traits. Again, comparing the two. So here we have um, a four locus model, we have a trait locus, a preference locus, and we have two loci that allows us to get these hybrid incompatibilities. So our one ones and two twos are purebreds, our one twos and two ones, like these recombinants, have low fitness. And what you're looking at here is the preference strength on the x-axis, and this is an eigenvalue um, describing the rate of evolution of the preference allele on the y-axis. You can see these rates are very low. Um, you can also see the female preference curve is higher than the male preference curve. So we do get some evolution of male preferences and female preferences. It's slow. And the equilibrium values, again, are not very impressive. So female preferences are evolving here to a polymorphic frequency a little bit above 0.1. And male preferences are evolving tiny, tiny little bit, but again, not very impressive at all. Now, this is actually a pretty difficult case for the evolution of preferences under reinforcement because when you have two separate preference alleles, one of which has to be maintained in each population, there are well-established reasons in the speciation literature why that should be a little bit tricky. So I also examined a case that's much more favorable to the evolution of preferences in general, and that's the evolution of choosiness for males that, or males or females that look like you. So preference is really being expressed here as just choosiness in general over a background of not caring when both males and females are expressing the trait and you're just trying to choose someone that matches you. And this has been shown in a lot of speciation models, Sergey describes this in his book, to be a very powerful mechanism compared to the preference mechanism of actually leading to evolution of population-specific mating. 
So what we um, see when we look at this type of mating, this evolution of choosiness, um, here we have preference strength again on the x-axis, rate of evolution on the y-axis. You can see the rates are faster than they were before. Um, this top curve is actually, oh, there's supposed to be a circle here, which disappeared on this slide. This is really strange. Um, this is with selection against hybrids. The bottom curve is actually without selection against hybrids. So you can actually get these population-specific preferences evolving even without selection against hybrids with this type of model. And the solid lines are for female preferences, and the dashed are for male preferences. And you can see female preferences are, are um, evolving quicker than male preferences. And, um, they all evolved, I should say, to complete fixation. So we're really just looking at rates here. Um, male preferences are battling against this direct competition cost that they've had, uh, that we explained with the null model. So they're a little bit lower, but they are actually evolving. And I'm happy to talk to anyone later about the, the odd shape of this curve. So it's something I've actually looked at quite a lot. So we can get male preferences evolving here. One other thing we looked at in this situation, and this is in collaboration with Ruben Dukas, is what if, oh yes, yeah, sorry. Back, yeah. Yes, this is small. If you make it bigger, it can reach, it can, you can still get this going until you kind of hit a, a rate that's too high and then the whole thing can't happen. You mean which one? So it, it, it will affect it, yes, definitely, yeah. But if, if you have migration that's too high, yeah. nothing's going to happen, yeah. And I actually don't know which one will fall off first, male preference or female preference. I'm guessing male, but I'm not sure. Um, so if you actually let um, male, males adjust their courtship, so strengthen their preferences because of learning, previous learning experiences, this is something else Ruben Dukas and I looked at in this case. So what, um, there are many species where males either enhance their preference for conspecifics if they have previous experience courting conspecifics, or enhance their avoidance of heterospecifics if they try to court some and they get a bad reaction. So this is sort of a behavioral reinforcement that um, influences preference strength. And what we see if we um, look at some assumptions here, I'm not going to go into detail, uh, is if we have more learning happening, which is kind of going in this direction on the graph, we actually get, uh, this is um, rate of spread of that choos uh, choosiness allele again, we actually get a range for male preferences where we can't get evolution of choosiness at all, whereas with female preferences, this is with no learning, we can always get choosiness evolving. So there are certain situations where even though this is very favorable for male preferences and female preferences, male preferences, because they have this competition cost kind of drop off the map of being able to evolve earlier than female preferences would. Okay, so um, can we get male choice evolving when male, uh, female traits indicate the identity of incipient species? Um, yes, that is one way we can get it happening. I gave it a blue check for the preference, um, the two preferences in different populations mechanism, which is just not very impressive in general. Um, and I gave it a green check for the choosiness mechanism. That is certainly a way you can get these sorts of male preferences evolving. So if we look at these characteristics of the female trait in general, we can see they're kind of a mixed bag. Um, these all, on the face of it, seem like sensible ways that you could get male preferences evolving. And some of them work and some of them don't. Um, but they're not, you know, there's no consistent message here. So how about characteristics of the male behavior? So one of the first things we looked at here, and this was with Russ Landy, is um, what happens if males have variable courtship effort? So one of the key assumptions that I made before was that males have equal courtship efforts. Remember, all the males had six units of courtship that they could give to different females. Um, so what if you change that to males with a preference court more? And there are a few biological reasons why this could happen. It could be that males that um, have more energy or in better shape um, can court or can bias their courtship, can express a preference, and other males can't. They just sort of have to you know, court where they can. It could be that males are sort of broadcast courting, so they're, they're maybe broadcasting a song, but if they have a preference, they can also direct that to a female, to a specific female, and so they don't lose any of the kind of broadcasting capabilities, but they're also maybe gaining something by directing their behavior. So there's a few reasons why this might happen. And there's also many different assumptions you could make about how mathematically you could get males with a preference to court more. So what is the relationship between 
their strength of preference and the amount more that they can court. And so what um, Russ and I assumed is that male courtship effort is proportional to their preference. So just one way you could make an assumption here. So if you look at this assumption, and we look at the same tracking of um, the preference frequency through their life cycle, so we're comparing again between the frequency in zygotes and the frequency in successfully mated males, we now find that we get a positive difference. So direct selection in this model actually favors male preferences. So um, why does this happen? Uh, we end up with the male preference being fixed. So why? So if we return to the birds. Um, here again, we have males with no preference courting indiscriminately. And we have males with a preference courting indiscriminately, but also having extra preferences that they're giving to this females that they prefer more. And this would again be in proportion to their preference strength. So it seems obvious here that, yeah, OK, we're not having any sacrifice on the part of the males that have a preference. And um, we would then get direct selection favoring the male preference. You could also imagine versions where this assumption isn't so strong, right? You could imagine um, cases where they get a little bit of an advantage here, but they also do suffer some loss here. And so really, I think the, the answer is going to be a, kind of an empirical one. We have to really know whether this sort of thing happens and whether you see males with a preference courting more and to what degree that maps onto preference strength. But conceptually, this should illustrate that we can get this sort of behavior, and it will depend, again, on this exact relationship. OK, so males having variable courtship effort, yes, that is one way we could get this reversing. All right, and then what if extra male courtship is preferred by females? So this would be um, a, the characteristic of the male behavior being how much, how much he courts. Maybe females actually care about how much more you're courting over a baseline value. So there's many species in which males that court more have higher success. But the thing I haven't really seen, even though I've looked, and maybe it's out there, maybe some of the empirical folks could help me with this, is whether there's evidence that females disproportionately prefer male courtship. So it's not just that they will mate with males that court more in proportion to how much more those males are courting, but they will disproportionately mate more with males that are courting more. So they actually prefer lots of courtship. Um, so to look at this, Sandra South and Joran Arquist and I developed a model where we had a female preference for extra courtship. And we looked at this in two different ways. One way was we had a flat preference for extra courtship. So any male that's courting above the baseline, like the least amount of courtship, is preferred by the same amount. And we also had a weighted preference for extra courtship. So how much more are females preferring a male that's courting more depends on how much more he's courting over a baseline courtship amount. If I didn't confuse everybody, you, you get the picture, right? They got how much more they're courting is what they really, how, as affects how much more they like these males. So um, here we have a graph for flat preferences, and here we have a graph for weighted preferences. This is P2 on the x-axis and T2 on the y-axis, the same sorts of graphs we were looking for with that Kirkpatrick model and the, the uh, models at the beginning. And these are lines of equilibrium for different strengths of um, this parameter that describes how much more females like extra courtship. So this is very weak preference for extra courtship, this black line. This dashed gray one is, is really strong preferences for extra courtship. Um, these lines of equilibrium are present not because of a balance between natural selection and sexual selection the way it was in the Kirkpatrick model, but they're here because of inherent frequency dependence of this preference for extra courtship. So these are, uh, the Kirkpatrick model has this property where if you add cost to preferences, the lines of equilibrium disappear. These lines do not have that property. These lines are frequency dependent. They'll be there anyway. Now, the trajectories with which you reach these lines in this model are practically horizontal. So that means if you're starting to the left, let's look at this dashed black line here of a kind of weakish preference for extra courtship. If you're starting to the left of the line, you'll evolve basically horizontally until you hit the line. If you're starting to the right, preferences will actually drop in frequency until you hit the line. If you're starting with really high frequency of the trait, you'll actually evolve like, until you get preference fixation. So as you can see, you actually would need really high trait frequencies, which it's not clear why those would be around. Uh, well, yeah, it's not clear why those would be around, why you'd have a high trait frequency. Usually, biologically, you'd imagine if you're looking at evolution of preferences and traits and the traits don't have an inherent advantage, they might be down here somewhere. So um, it seems most likely from this that we'd evolve to a polymorphic 
um, preference frequency. And we're really not evolving, again, the, the trait very much unless we put viability selection on it in one direction or another. So the situation gets even worse with weighted preferences. So here there's, there's basically no way to get very high preference frequencies. There is here, again, if we have some other reason that the trait's going to start at a high frequency and if these preferences are very strong. So this is a way that you could get male preferences evolving is if courtship, extra courtship itself is preferred. Um, but it's, you know, it's kind of moderately effective, maybe not very effective depending on what we think about tra trait frequencies. So I gave that one a, a blue check for usually reaching a polymorphism. All right, and then what about strategic allocation of courtship? So what if these males are really smart and they see themselves in a high competition situation and they just get out of it? So this is a model that I did um, in collaboration with Jonathan Rowell, who was a postdoc here for a while. Um, and we looked at a fast time, slow time system. So in fast time, males are assessing basically their ecological situation with respect to the female being a limiting resource, and they're following an ideal free distribution in that they're just moving and uh, away from the females if they're in a high competition situation and kind of evening out their courtship um, depending on the, the resource. Uh, the slow time system is evolution of the preference and trait. So what we get here, uh, we have time on the x-axis on this graph, genotype frequency on the y-axis. This genotype X4 at a high frequency is no preference and no trait. Genotype X1 is, a, is the preference and trait, male preference and female trait. And these mixed genotypes of having a preference and no trait and no preference and a trait are at very low frequencies. So we, we, this is about the best case scenario we got. We can get a little bit of evolution of male preferences to a polymorphic equilibrium. So what is going on in this model in general? So here we have our kind of original graph from before with the unornamented female and the ornamented female and the males kind of skewing their courtship. So this one had a heck of a lot of males courting her. Now, if males um, are conforming to an ideal free distribution and they're strategically allocating courtship, we still have the fact that the, whether or not a male moves is going to depend on his attraction to the resource. So the males that are more attracted to these ornamented females are the males with a preference. So as we get movement of males, the males that are most likely to move are the males that prefer that female less. So the males that don't really care who they're mating. So we do get equal number of males courting each female, but we tend to actually get um, a distribution where the males that don't care are courting the unornamented female and the males that care are courting the ornamented female. So this does two things. First of all, it removes competition, so it removes direct selection. It doesn't reverse direct selection, so we sort of are now maybe seeing a little bit why we didn't get evolution of the preference and trait past this little polymorphism, because we've just removed the force that was acting against the preference, but we haven't actually given the preference a benefit. Um, and we also end up actually with that assorted mating where those two mixed genotypes were very low frequencies, and that occurs because we have um, disproportionately males without a preference mating with the unornamented female, and males with a preference mating with the ornamented female. So we get the two things of polymorphism and assortment coming out of this model. Okay, so that one gets a blue check. We get a polymorphism, not incredibly impressive. I'm just going to talk really briefly about a couple changes in the mating system. Um, but before that, as you can see, these characteristics of, uh, characteristics of male behavior are a little bit more successful than these female trait characteristics, at least the ones that we looked at. Um, in reversing this selection against the male uh, preference. So again, I'm, I'm going to talk really briefly here, but the first thing I want to look at is what if preferred females have higher mating success? So now I'm departing from polygyny. So far we've stuck with very strict polygyny for the whole talk. I just want to talk briefly about what happens if we relax that assumption. So um, if you remember, again, male preferences are usually lost because of this courtship bias. Um, but what if females uh, actually have more mates? Let me go back here a second. What if these females actually have more, higher mating success in general and some of these females go unmated? So that's what we're really looking at here. Um, so this, this graph that we had before for threshold fecundity advantage, it turns out that we can also interpret this exact same graph as a threshold mating advantage. And that's because these females that are ornamented, they could be having more offspring as a group because they're each having more offspring, or they could be having more offspring as a group because as a group they have higher mating success than the females that are unornamented. So you could actually interpret 
the exact same mathematical equations two ways biologically. Just the group of females with the trait have to have higher reproductive success than the group of females without the trait. And so again, we, we could have this threshold where if you're more successful than a certain um, threshold, you get male preferences evolving. And if you're less, less successful, you don't. Now, this um, would really apply with this interpretation if we assumed that females with the trait had a fixed advantage to having the trait, a fixed amount of being more likely to mate than the unornamented females. But it's probably more interesting to look at a frequency dependent advantage. So probably your risk of going unmating, unmated is not just a fixed risk, right? It's a risk that depends on the frequency of males with this preference in the population. So that's a direction we haven't looked at yet. But again, this should give you kind of an idea of what this assumption might do. Um, but it, there's a lot more subtlety here than we've really explored with this interpretation. And then, um, so that is a way you could get male preferences evolving. And again, there's a lot more to be done there, I think. And then I want to talk just really briefly about monogamy. So this is a, certainly a case where you see male preferences in nature. So what if you completely chuck the polygyny assumption and we're looking at monogamous pairings? So with monogamy, if males don't get chosen initially by a female, they're going to eventually get chosen by someone. So if you think of strict monogamy, we're going to get everybody paired maybe eventually, but just the order in which they're paired or you know, the identity of their mate is going to differ depending on whether you have a preference or not. So um, with monogamy, it's possible to create a model at least where male and female roles are completely interchangeable. So we could have uh, sort of the same, we could switch the identity of males and females without any changes in the assumptions. Um, and again, this is because preferences can determine pair identity. But in a strict monogamy model, there actually is no sexual selection at all, right? Everybody gets a mate. And there are ways to assume that you get some benefit from pairing early or pairing late. But if we, again, if we're looking kind of at a null model situation and we chuck all that out the window, just baseline, we can get everybody paired without sexual selection. So my postdoc, Caitlin and Stern, and I are finishing up, former postdoc, are finishing up a paper right now where we're looking at a monogamy model with these sorts of assumptions, where we're examining evolution of preferences for female size, and we're interpreting it as female size because we're assuming there's a viability selection cost to the trait, but again, a fecundity benefit. And the thing about a fecundity benefit in a monogamy model when you have a pair is fecundity selection actually acts on a pair, right? So the male and the female both benefit when there's fecundity selection. So when you have fecundity selection, um, this is a, a pretty clear way of illustrating that this leads to direct selection for the male preference. So if you're preferring a female with high fecundity, that gives you a direct benefit. So we can get, I'm not showing you any details here because it's all still being finished up. Um, you can get male preferences evolving in this situation. Again, it's kind of a completely different situation from the polygyny one, but it is a way we can get male preferences evolving. So monogamy gets a check. So I just want to draw some general principles out of this graph. So I'm going to move that up to the top. So in all the cases where we have male preferences evolving, we have to kind of fight against this direct selection against male preferences that's present in the null model, which we've shown is there due to competition. So males, when you have a preference, you're biasing your courtship. Biasing your courtship is a bad thing to do if every female is having equal mating success because you get yourself into this high competition situation if you have this bias. So um, we've looked at a few mechanisms here um, which use one particular way of getting around this direct selection cost, and that is by removing it. So direct selection against male preferences can be removed in these strategies here when males have variable courtship effort. We're in the strategic allocation. Again, you're just moving away if you're in the high competition situation. So you're removing this um, cost. And monogamy also removes the cost because everyone eventually gets paired. So those are fairly successful ways of actually getting at least a polymorphism in male preferences. You can also um, counter this direct selection. And you can counter it in two ways. So one way is by opposing direct selection. So two direct selection forces opposing one another, one against male preferences because of competition, and the other one for male preferences. And that occurs when you have high fecundity of the trait, right? because fecundity is a property of the pair, um, when the extra male courtship is preferred by females, or when preferred females have higher mating success. So again, it's the same model as a fecundity one. 
Or you could counter it by opposing indirect selection. We, and we expect that to not be as effective because indirect selection is usually weaker than direct selection because it's mediated by the strength of the statistical association. And that's what we see. Those mechanisms that rely on countering direct selection with indirect selection are not very effective. So that's when you have honest indicators of high viability. Or when you indicate the identity of the incipient species in the model that's really analogous, most analogous to these other ones, it's, it's that one with the, the preferences, not with the choosiness. And the preferences one didn't produce anything incredibly impressive. That was a blue check where you just got a low polymorphism. Um, there's also the possibility of genetic constraint. And that's what we saw with pleiotropy. That also is not a particularly effective way of countering this direct selection because it's constraining what's happening with male preferences. It's kind of dragging it up in these as, as uh, you know, pleiotropic effect of female preference evolution, but we're not really getting rid of this direct selection against the male preferences with this constraint model. So um, this one I usually put up for an empirical crowd, but this is my wish list of what I would like to know. Um, people are studying male mate choice more and more in the last 10 years, but there's still a lot of work that needs to be done. So this, this kind of conglomerate of models makes a lot of predictions about when you would see male mate choice, but I'd really like to see like a big meta-analysis that I don't want to do personally of um, all of these things. So a lot of data would need to be collected still on all these. So what kinds of female traits are preferred? Are they just high fecundity? Are there ever arbitrary badges? How do male preferences relate to total courtship output? Can males with preferences court more? How common is pleiotropy? Can males strategically allocate courtship, or do they, are they blind to that kind of thing? Um, how do females respond to increased courtship? Do they actually ever prefer increased courtship? And with that, I'd like to thank my collaborators and um, Nescent, UNC, and NSF. And thank you. Wow, that's very impressive. <laughs> Too much stuff. <laughs> yeah. I saw hands in the back. <laughs> Questions? Elizabeth. Wait, wait. The mic. We're, we're recording there. <laughs> Hi. So um, I guess my my observation is just for your empirical side. Ah, oh, yes. Yeah. So I think some really nice work is being shown by Gail Patricelli right now on tactical allocation oh, in okay. Sage Grouse for so strategic allocation. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. So you should. And I don't know if it's published. Yet. She showed it at a talk recently. Oh, okay. So that might be why you oh, haven't yeah. seen it. All right. Um, and so oh, it's really nice. So she's looking at that behind yeah. in the literature, but yeah, all right, yeah. great, yeah. thank you. So that's, that's a good one, and she might, I don't think she's asking this question, but with her data, she might actually be able to get at whether females respond to increased courtship, because you do see variation in courtship allocation by the sage-grouse sage males, by like how much, yeah. like males vary in how much they That court. would be a good, so that would be the perfect system, actually, yeah. for this. Yeah. yeah, so that might be an interesting okay. place for yeah. data. Cool, thank you. And then my question was, in, in the, one of the models that worked where you showed, um, that you did have evolution of the male preference, you sort of had to start with the trait of, of, of courtship, of lots of courtship, and you're like, you know, why would you have that? Why would you necessarily have that trait already expressed? Yeah. Um, and I was thinking, wondering if you thought about like behavioral syndromes, like uh, just sort of higher activity levels, more bold males, that you mm. might already have that as like a correlated feature of another trait. Mm. So you just see higher activity levels, uh -huh. higher courtship. That might be something to think yeah. about. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, so I may have uh, missed this completely. In the monogamous case, yeah. Um, so if indeed there's different survivorships of males and females, so that there, there wasn't is in that model. That yeah, we had to put it the same models. We couldn't get. Yeah. Own so yeah. so the question is: Is there and and maybe for the other cases as well? Is there if you add stochasticity oh. to the probability of finding effectively a mate? Yeah. Does that not change some of these? It probably would. Uh, so you're saying add in search costs effectively. Um, in, well, stochasticity would produce search costs, Yeah, right? that's because one way of producing Yeah, that. one yeah. way of producing search costs. Um, yeah, I mean, so we were assuming that we had, we were not mate limited, so we had infinite number of mates. And polygyny, you, you could have a lot fewer males, right? But we, here we have selection of the female trait. So, well... So, so yeah. I, I guess what I'm asking is, if indeed there were cases in which there were really different um, sex ratios yeah. at adulthood, okay, yeah. would that lead to very different conclusions? 
Um, so with polygyny, it really you can really have like yeah, no, just I, as long as you have enough I, males. I guess I'm thinking monogamy. So yeah, oh, monogamy, yeah, yeah. monogamy. Yes, you probably could. But the monogamy model, I have to say, was really hard to make. Um, and one of the things we had to assume was to get. We ignored this problem by assuming we had selection on both sexes, expression of trait in both sexes, so we could get equal sex ratios. So it's a good question, and I haven't thought it through. Again, with polygyny, I don't think it'd be an issue because yeah. you just need sufficient males sufficient number of males. But, but there's still the stochasticity and miscuing, and if yes. it's a bad year and this and it switches, you know. Yeah, 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 yeah. What would that do? Yeah. I don't know. I should think about it more. Yeah. Thank you. So thank you, Maria. So I wanted to ask you, uh, connects to the, to the empirical bit, about what your, the quality of results of the models tell us about attempting to infer mechanism from observational studies. Dangerous. So, yeah. So what struck me was your strategic allocation model whereby the indifferent males, the combination of indifference and strategy would look a whole lot like a preference for the unornamented females. It would, yeah. Yeah, so that would be actually a problem if you were, I mean, I think you could get around that by actually doing controlled choice tests, but if you were just trying to infer preferences by observation, you would potentially run into a problem. Yeah, that was a good point. <laughs> um, I was, this may just be speaking to my ignorance about this particular subject, but I was kind of curious about how your models may um, uh, apply uh, or potentially in the future may, um, maybe, uh, may apply to a circumstance in which case there are sneaker males uh -huh. and there are just regular um, very dominant males, females, uh, and how choice may be applied in those various scenarios. So you're having a whole other category of males that aren't choosing. Well, are they choosing? So what are the sneaker males yeah, doing? I yeah, I haven't thought about it at all. And it would probably make me, take me a while to think through. Um, and I think a lot would depend on whether these sneaker males are mating at random where they're choosing and whether they can carry preferences but not express them, which might just sort of slow down preference loss. I think there would have to be a lot of things that I'd have to sort out. But that's interesting, yeah. Good question. Um, Maria? Yeah, yes. So um, your wish list here is basically about uh, uh, biological uh, reality of the models. Biological reality. Can't be that. Could you go one, one slide back, but uh, I mean, where you have your list? This one? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the whole thing. The whole thing. Yeah, but you also yeah, kind of make predictions here that you can test. You, you, you did yeah. mention like meta-analysis, right? Yes. So kind of looking across the I don't the know if the data is there, but yeah. So, um, uh, yeah. Whether the, yeah. So you, you don't think that's um, av available because that's kind of very clear list of predictions. Whenever you have a male mate choice, there should be should this you? or that. I mean, there, right? there, might be, there might be data for... Um, I think some of these things there might not be data for. There might be data for what types of traits are actually preferred. Mm -hmm. That one I would think there, I mean, I don't know like a meta-analysis, mm -hmm. like a statistical meta-analysis, but there, my, my dream when Nescent came into being was to get a postdoc interested in doing this, and it never happened, because I don't want to do it. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> well, I told you it didn't happen, so it's all good. Um, yeah, so uh, because, well, I think it would be interesting. Um, I think there might be data on that because there is certainly a lot of data on female traits that are preferred, but I don't know that there's data on, on these other things. I didn't do it, Lou. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and I have one more kind of more, I think, in technical question. Um, like, uh, we know about models, but right? Uh, uh, predictions depend on yes. what assumptions and like, when you look at the history of mathematical modeling, like in evolutionary biology or ecology, whenever somebody is kind of uh, making particular claims, there will be somebody else who would show that, well, no, no. Right. Uh, it only under some conditions. For example, like in the 70s when we were fighting its selection or its random drift, but whoever publishes a paper showing that something can happen by selection, then there will be somebody from Kimura's group showing, no, it's the same thing <laughs> right. you, you can get. Yeah, so I mean, uh, what's your feeling? Uh, how robust uh, are these uh, conclusions uh, 
Um, yeah. uh, uh, of course, general. that's something yeah. you don't want to probably go. Uh, you, you, well, I, uh, um, uh, yeah. So, so let's see. How robust are they? Well, for for example, like genetics, right? And genetics. Uh, and uh, the mean ug uh, ugly thing about multi-locus models is that at some point certain details start. M yeah, matter, start mattering. Uh, so yeah. these are actually the one thing I like about these models, and that um, I feel pretty comfortable about with them, is that we're avoiding that line of equilibrium that's present in the Kirkpatrick one, because that's a tricky thing. It comes about um, because of the genetics, and Landy has a line, and Kirkpatrick has a line, and they're there for entirely different reasons, mm -hmm. even though p most people don't really appreciate that. Um, and here there is no line because well, the, the fact that you have this competition causing direct selection. It's sort of a fairly robust and intuitive prediction. So the, the null model prediction, I feel pretty comfortable with being fairly robust. Uh, some of these other predictions, I think, are probably more sensitive. Like the, the speciation one is going to depend a lot, I think, on, um, you know, again, the genetics of the mating and, you know, whether it's choosiness or whether it's preference or what the background is like. Is the background the opposite preference or is it random mating? Or, so some of these other ones, but the basic, you know, the thing that I'm kind of, I like most about this is the identification of the null model problem, and that I think is actually pretty robust. So, so, and I haven't thought much about stochasticity, and so that would be something that we get to think about, I think. That's my answer. Uh, thank you. Um, there are a lot of, uh, there are a lot of situations that could be thought of similarly like to like courtship. You know, e even if, uh, you know, um, like, say, uh, applying to college or looking for jobs, mm. there's lots of, there's lots of semi-analogous situations. And I huh. was, I was wondering if you've, if you've thought about uh, what you found here, maybe in some other um, frame, like, other situations than simply just mating. But in, in I like totally have and not, and that's a good point. Okay. Yeah. There, it probably is applicable to some other things. I should think about that. That's a great idea. Yeah. So, so Maria, I'm looking at the the list of um, that sort of the male preferences, um, and it's always uh, as one would begin. It's always kind of aligned directly with the trade itself. So they favor the trade or they don't. Um, it, and it makes me wonder if they're if you've explored uh, or would countenance at all. Uh, more mixed strategies on the part of the males. I mean, if it were favoring mixed mating, that will likely lead you back to a random mating model. Like, I'm going to spread my bets. If I've previously yeah. mated with a trait carrying an ornamented female, next time I will mate with mm. an ornamented. But I wondered about favoring rare strategies that. I haven't looked at favoring rare strategies, but I would think that that wouldn't work either. Again, because you, no matter who you. Well, if you favor rare strategies, you're really going to put yourself in a competition problem, right? Because all the males with preferences are going to be courting the same one rare female. So I wouldn't think that would work at all intuitively because of that issue. Um, could try it, but I don't think it would work. No, uh, Nels brought the question of our preferences. So our preferences suit trees, right? So <laughs> <laughs> that's where we hope to see you guys. So thank you very thank much. Thank you.